Okay, so we are recording the call. Um, and today, let's see, welcome everybody. This is the NRP engagement, I guess, webinar at this point with so many people. Um, and today, so just so you know, if you need to unmute and ask a question, you can or use the chat box. Um, but today we have uh, Igor Sviligoy and Frank Worthine and what I've been calling this on Twitter is all the GPUs for science and I'll let Igor describe the real title. Um, but Igor Filigoy is a lead scientific software developer and researcher at UC San Diego and San Diego Supercomputing Center. And Frank Worthline is the executive director of the Open Science Grid and professor of physics at UC San Diego. And if you want, as you all got the link, you can read their full glorious bios. Um, and with that, I want to cut myself short so that we can get to the super exciting part of the talk, which is, Igor, are you starting or is Frank? Uh, Frank will be starting, e but I will uh, uh, share the slides. Terrific. Yeah, we're figuring, I'm calling in from a, a hotel room in Atlanta, so uh, I'm figuring that it probably is uh, safer if Igor shows the slides and I talk at the beginning and then we'll hand over uh, uh, to him and he will uh, talk about the technical stuff. Sure. So, um, hello everybody. So, uh, uh, Igor, next slide. Yeah, yeah, trying, let's see if it works, yep. Ah, uh, there we go. So um, uh, this is talk uh, today is about a, a um, experiment we did um, this Saturday before supercomputing. And the slide here is, is basically the, the, uh, um, the bottom line. Um, Jensen Huang, in his keynote at supercomputing in uh, 2019, um, gave us a shout out by showing this slide and talking about it for a, a, a few minutes. And um, we uh, um, aggregated 50,000 NVIDIA GPUs in the cloud. Um, it actually ended up being a 380 petaflop uh, uh, cluster for two hours. And the uh, stuff was distributed across US, Europe, and Asia. So literally a, a, a globally distributed uh, infrastructure in the cloud, just like we're used to for uh, grid computing. And um, the scale of this was literally such that on Saturday morning before supercomputing, we bought all GPU capacity that was for sale in Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud Platform worldwide. And this talk is about um, first uh, the science justification, then technically how we did this, and then at the end, how much does it cost? And, and uh, what does it mean for doing things like this on a regular basis? What's sort of the cost structure of these kinds of things? Um, Igor's next slide, please. So, but before we get into, the, uh, into all of this, I want to say a few words about how we did we get here. How could we even be in a position where we would be so um, aggressive as to try to something like this? And, and the uh, long story short is that this plot here shows the annual ice cube GPU use via OSG. They peaked at about 3000 GPUs for a day. And um, there is therefore a long history between ice cube, Condor and OSG to work together in order to provide them with a <coughs> global infrastructure where they can um, uh, effectively harvest global resources to their heart's content. And uh, we support that uh, on a 24 seven basis. And um, it's a long-term investment that IceCube has made into a DHTC distributed high throughput compute as the computing paradigm. And at this uh, specific Saturday uh, uh, before uh, supercomputing, we produced about 3% of the annual photon propagation simulations in a two hour cloud burst. So uh, in, a, in a, 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 I think it's about, uh, if I remember, uh, the math correctly, it's something like, uh, like two weeks worth of production in two hours or something like that. Um, next slide. And so let me now uh, go to the science use case. Um, IceCube is an instrument that uh, is um, 5,160 phototubes. And you can see in this picture um, 
uh, I can't, given that I'm not sharing, I can't use my pointer. Is that correct? You don't see me pointing anywhere, right? Correct. Okay, fine. So uh, in that, uh, in the uh, picture on the top, uh, yeah, we right, can see your pointer. Uh, that's me... that's Igor's pointer. Igor's trying to point where, where oh, okay. uh, guessing where I point, where I would point if I was pointing. So there is this little uh, um, little picture to uh, uh, in blue to the uh, left um, in this in here. That is the uh, photo tube. It's about um, uh, it's about uh, the size of when you open your arms and and, and try to hug somebody. And uh, these these sensors, there's five thousand one hundred sixty of them. They are strung into the ice uh, about a kilometer deep. Um, I think fourteen hundred fifty meters deep. And then they are uh, have instrumented an array down there, which is literally a, a kilometer cube. So it's it's about a, a, a kilometer deep from 1450 to 2820 at its maximum depth, and um, it is about a square kilometer in uh, width. And um, they they build this facility with a very diverse science goals, and there's as a list of things uh, on this on the side here: astrophysics, particle physics, and earth sciences. And um, among all of these, I will restrict myself in this talk to talk about the high energy astrophysics goals and um, the uh, uh, ice cubes long term perspective. Is that they have been taking data for about ten years and they expect to be taking data until about 2040 or so if they get their next round of funding to continue upgrading the instrument. Um, and the picture at the bottom here is their uh, counting house in, at, at the ice cube, ice, uh, ice pole, sorry, at the Antarctic South Pole. And so what you see here, these funny towers are basically the, uh, um, the uh, uh, cable trays um, this is where all the cables come from uh, the kilometer cube device. Next slide. So what do they do? The high energy astrophysics case, science case for ice cube is that um, the universe is a very violent place. There are lots of things happening in the universe that are uh, uh, span in exorbitant energies. Um, and one of the features of the universe is that it is actually opaque to light meaning it, it gets, uh, uh, light does not uh, transmit from faraway places if the photons are high enough in energy. And what you see here in the top picture, the black piece is the opaqueness. So what this picture shows, it's the distance in megaparsec on the y-axis and the energy of the photons on the x-axis. So in an energy range from about 10 to 11 electron volts upwards, um, uh, the universe starts being dark for photons we do not see photons, photons cannot reach us uh, at energies above that. That of course is deadly because almost everything that we know about the universe comes from photons, right? And so if, uh, and this means that far away, very violent processes cannot be recorded by telescopes or by, uh, on earth or in, in, in space. And so we need something else. And uh, voila, here comes uh, neutrinos and gravitational waves and the, a buzzword of multimedia astrophysics is literally the fact that we are convinced that the same physics phenomenon out there in the universe will send um, neutrinos, gravitational waves, and light in some cases. And therefore, we will use the neutrinos to measure the energy and to infer that the, uh, uh, um, this is a um, violent event is literally uh, one of the most violent events, and then look for the telescopes to tell us what exactly is going on by measuring all of the lower energy photons that this event sends. And at the bottom here, you can see that there are indeed galactic, extragalactic uh, cosmic neutrinos. It's basically the high end spectrum of neutrinos. And um, it's basically background free as long as the energy is measured correctly. Next slide. Um, this is another way of looking at the previous plot, the bottom plot on the previous slide. This is a publication in Science from 2013, where IceCube saw, published the first, um, I've forgotten how many, uh, first 28 very high energy neutrinos, 
from outside the solar system. That's the black points here. The red points are basically a, um, uh, uh, Fermi's, uh, um, the uh, um, nah, photons from the Fermi satellite and the uh, um, solid line is the prediction for what ice cubes should be seeing. So what you're seeing here is ice cubes measurements of extragalactic um, or cosmic neutrinos. And um, this demonstrates both the opaqueness because you see the red thing going down and not reaching all the way out to the energy so that the, the uh, black points are at. And it, it demonstrates that there are neutrinos that we still see all the way out there. Next slide. So this is a proof of principle. Now this slide describes what we're actually trying to do scientifically with IceCube. Um, we know that high energy events happen in the universe. The question is, what are they? And the hypothesis is that you have some kind of extremely high spiraling weirdo event in the universe that sends out both photons and uh, electrons. Um, you then have, and protons on most likely, you then have these two reactions, which uh, for the purpose of this talk is probably sufficient to uh, uh, realize that at the very end, these two reactions leads to photons and neutrinos. So anytime you see a neutrino, you should also expect that there are photons of the same, um, uh, the same um, energy, roughly, that are also being sent. And so if we see a neutrino at very high energies, we should be seeing photons at a wide range of energies that tell us then and, and allow us to understand what the kind of phenomenon is that we're actually talking about. And that's the uh, goal ultimately in multimaster astrophysics. Next slide. Now, in order to do this in an actual instrument, there are challenges in the instrument. And those challenges lead to why these simulations are necessary and why uh, we need so much GPU power. And um, I'm trying to explain this with this one slide. Let me try to start on the uh, uh, far right. Um, this three-dimensional or uh, uh, the uh, plot is trying to show the ice properties as they change both with depth in meters as well as in wavelength in, in nanometers. And uh, what's uh, shown here is on the, on the third axis, the, efficient, the scatter, efficiency for scattering. And um, so what you see here is that as you go deeper into the ice, scattering is less likely, but it still goes all over the map. And in order to or, um, see something in ice cube, see photons in ice cube, and then point back to where they came from, such that then telescopes can look there and see the light, um, you need to have an, an exquisite ice model because now we're going to the top left plot. That top left plot is the deposit energy in TV and the median angular uh, 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 resolution. Uh, so basically the error on the angular resolution. The red curve is what you'd expect from statistics and the blue dots is the actual measured one. So what you see is that at high energy, this is completely dominated by systematics. It's basically not understanding the ice and propagation properties of the photons, and therefore we don't point back as well as we should. And the, the uh, lower left plot is a specific example. It's actually one of these very high energy uh, uh, neutrino events. And what the different and uh, circles or ellipses show you is different ice models and the prediction that they give you where the point is actually where the uh, uh, neutrino originated. And you can see that they don't even over, uh, overlap particularly well. So there is a systematics problem here, and that's what they use these simulations for. So effectively, what IceCube does, it generates, it has a, a, a Fortran program that generates the, uh, um, the uh, um, shower all the way to the photons that is run on CPUs. And then the photon propagation in ice is run on GPUs because they have this ex extraordinarily e e efficient uh, um, version of their photon propagation program on GPUs. And by uh, doing these simulations, they ultimately understand the reconstruction and the pointing accuracy for high energy neutrinos better 
via making better ice models and making better reconstruction. That's basically the name of the game. Any questions at this point? We're good so far? Then let's go to slide 11. Um, and what ultimately then comes out when this is done is science like the one that uh, gave uh, was this uh, publication in 2018. Um, this is, uh, uh, was a big deal in the NSF um, in that they uh, even made a special event for it. Um, Ice Cube found a high energy uh, uh, neutrino in, in real time, sent a, a uh, alerted the astronomy community of the observation of a single such uh, uh, high energy neutrino. And then astronomers, astronomers the world over looked for it and actually found a correlated event in the direction that the ice cube was pointing. And so, and the uh, event that they found was actually correlated to a blazer that was already known. Um, it's uh, designated as some weirdo number, TXS, whatever. And, um, it was identified as most likely source, and therefore it's the first time that there was a direct link established between a very, very high energy event in the cosmos and um, its known celestial object uh, that was known because of, uh, of uh, light measurements, photon measurements in uh, various different instruments. And this is what we're trying to uh, have happen more often, basically. Next slide. Um, now let's say a word or two about the future. I said that, uh, that IceCube is intending to uh, keep taking data until roughly 2040 or so. And I've put on this slide here, the upgrade schedule. Um, and and uh, they have, in essence, what you have right now is the, um, the orange thing here in the, under the ice indicated on this uh, plot that orange a cube is what they have today instrumented. They want to right now instrument at much more higher granularity something inside, which is the green. Then the next upgrade is a much larger uh, cube, which is sort of the, the, the strings that you can kind of see in black, at, as which they call the high energy array, um, uh, very coarsely placed over a large area. And then in addition, they want to put a radio array on top Bottom line, for the sake of this talk, Ice Cube is here to stay and has an upgrade plan that gets them into the th into the 2030s, and then they will run with this upgrade detector for about 10 years or so. Um, that's at least current planning. So the kind of thing that we're doing here is has a lot of future. There will be Ice Cube GPU um, production runs in the cloud and on prem for another few decades. Next slide. And now I'm handing it over to Igor to talk about the technical aspects of how we did this cloud burst um, in, across the cloud providers. Igor, your turn. Okay, can you hear me? Sounds good, Igor. Okay, thanks. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks, Frank. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to give a little bit of details of how we did it and starting with what we tried to accomplish to start with. So the idea was, Let's try to go out and try to get all the GPUs that are available for sale worldwide into a single logical pool. Uh, and HD Condor is what we use. Uh, there were about 28 regions across AWS, Azure, and Google that uh, were listed as having a significant amount of GPUs. Uh, and uh, we wanted to see how, how much of that we could get for a couple of hours. Uh, the couple of hours was so that we could actually ramp up to uh, the max, but not break our budget, since you know that the cloud computing is not free. Uh, and uh, then IceCube would submit their photopropagation workflow in this HD Condor pool, and we would handle it as a single logical pool, uh, like it was all collocated uh, without any special things. Uh, and we were hoping to get to a GPU burst that was at a scale that was comparable to what the future exascale HPC, HPC system were, just not tightly coupled because IceCube doesn't need it, but nevertheless at a similar scale. So IceCube, like all OSG user communities, 
is already using HD Condor for resource orchestration. It, so we were not trying to reinvent the wheel. We were, were in, uh, you, uh, interested in trying to use something that was as close to a production as possible. Nevertheless, we decided to go with the dedicated hardware setup. There were a couple of reasons for that. First, we didn't want to disrupt their existing production on OSG since this was essentially a research or, or experimental setup. We didn't really know how, what we will get out of it if, if we would uh, hit any unexpected problems. And moreover, this pool was expected to be much more bursty than what they usually expect on OSG. As Frank said, there you usually get um, up to 3000 GPUs. We were hoping for at least an order of magnitude more, maybe two if we were lucky. So we did a couple additional uh, tweaks to uh, this uh, setup to be more burst friendly, including multiple SCADDs. And I, I have a picture here, essentially, we had uh, 10 SCADDs um, to which uh, IceCube would submit. They actually were located in uh, Madison uh, alongside their uh, production resources. They were just dedicated for this. And for uh, uh, the Condor Collector, which is the, the thing that actually keeps the global state, uh, we introduced one other layer of indirection, which Condor uh, allows by aggregating all the uh, uh, resources first locally at each and every uh, uh, cloud region. And then those were propagated to the uh, global one uh, for the global uh, view. The uh, matchmaking and all the policy still happened in the central one, which is where the negotiator was running. The reason for having um, this tree-like structure is because Condor um, has uh, a non-negligible penalty to pay when you first connect a resource to a collector uh, due to the security handshake. And from that point on, it's relatively cheap. So by uh, having all the resources go to the local collector, uh, those, th that initial uh, uh, cost would be spread among all of them. And the collector to collector um, uh, connection is permanent. So it was, it's only paid once when you set up the uh, setup. So the center collector doesn't have to pay that. That allows us to scale much better. And it's actually a pretty standard setup. It's usually just the collectors are more collocated. So that's the idea about the setup. Uh, regarding uh, the data, we uh, decided to go the cautious path. So we decided we would pre-stage the data into the uh, native cloud storage. Uh, so that we would not need to uh, rely on the UW uh, storage to provide the spike of um, input that was needed, uh, which means that we had to distribute the data all over the world. We uh, did a semi-partition, so each file went to one to a few cloud regions. So we had some replication because we didn't really know where the GPUs would come from. We had a rough idea, but uh, it, turned, it actually turned out that our rough idea was pretty wrong. Uh, nevertheless, we had enough resources distributed that uh, we were able to get, uh, we had enough input files wherever the GPUs were. So lots of gases and some uh, replication. And for all the local, uh, the big uh, cloud regions, we read only from the local cloud storage. We never went over the wider network. There were a couple of regions that were expected to be small and were small in the end, for which we didn't do that. And we read uh, from another cloud region nearby, but uh, those were small enough that that was not a problem. And we used a similar uh, strategy for output, which was always staged to the local uh, cloud storage. And this is obviously much easier because you don't have to guess how much will go where. You just see after, you, after the fact. And then we had, uh, asynchronously uh, fetched all the data back to uh, UW after uh, the experiment, uh, the exercise was over. In order to de deal with the fact that uh, the files were not located um, back at uh, UW, uh, 
uh, I wrote some simple wrappers that knew where, where the closest cloud storage were, so uh, that uh, the IceCube jobs would not need to know any details about the cloud. From their point of view, it was very uniform. Uh, although they had to know that some regions had certain files and other didn't, but that's pretty standard procedure uh, in HD counter and OSG in general, where some sites provide local storage and you want to use it. So again, not uh, too exotic. Uh, it just uh, meant that not all the jobs could run everywhere. So any questions at this point? If not, let me go on. So that was the idea, that was the plan. And, but before putting it in practice, we wanted to make sure that all the bits and pieces were actually in place and we actually could pull it off. The first thing we wanted to uh, see is if the cloud local storage actually could deliver. As we said, we were expecting very uh, bursty uh, setup, uh, potentially thousands or tens of thousands for the biggest cloud regions. Uh, could uh, they deliver? So we went and just tested uh, reading uh, from uh, cloud storage um, on CPUs. We didn't, GPUs are way too expensive for that, but CPUs are good enough. And as you can see, uh, we easily exceeded one terabit per second uh, in uh, a single cloud region for all three cloud providers. And we could probably go much higher. We just stopped when we reached about uh, thousand uh, instances or uh, one terabit because we didn't expect we needed much more than that. So that part seemed to be a no brainer. So we said, good, uh, we can pull it off at this point. So local storage works great. Another thing uh, we want to see is how long would it take to move data from uh, on-prem into the cloud? And the test results were not bad. 20 gigabits per second uh, seemed to be pretty, uh, a non-issue. Uh, some links were faster, uh, but it's not nearly as great as reading from uh, local storage where we have terabits. And uh, so um, uh, that was further um, validation of our uh, idea that pre-staging into cloud storage was the safest paid forward. Uh, and I see somebody's asking if raw we got about 1.5 gigabits per second per compute instance in the best case. Uh, yeah, that, that's about right. Now, we also did some tests uh, over the wide area network, uh, where I mean internationally, and this is just going on-prem. And you see here we saw a lot of variability while we got uh, above uh, 40 gigabit per second on certain links, other links were in a one to few gigabits per second, which would probably not work for our uh, uh, highly burst, uh, bursty workload. So that definitely put a nail uh, into our idea that yes, we definitely should uh, go with local cloud storage because that way uh, we don't have to uh, worry about it. And as for what we used, it was object to block storage. It's definitely everything is uh, object storage uh, because we down, the workload is download the file uh, to a local file system, process it, create a new file uh, on local, local disk, and then up, upload it somewhere. So object storage works great for that. Okay, other questions about uh, storage before I move on and networking? If not, the other part uh, that was potentially problematic is could uh, Condor keep up uh, with managing this many uh, resources? Remember, we were uh, saying we want to be able to uh, be a, at least an order of magnitude bigger than the biggest that uh, IceCube ever ran before, which is about 3000 GPUs. So we said uh, we would like to get to about 90,000 uh, concurrent running. We don't expect that we'll get more from the cloud. Uh, so we provisioned uh, 90,000 
CPO instances. Uh, so from the Conda point of view, it looks just exactly identical as if they were GPUs because we get one instance per GPU, we just had one uh, CPU per, uh, per instance. And yep, everything worked fine. We uh, uh, used the same 28, uh, 28 uh, regions. We try to keep the number of uh, instances per region to about the same number as we would get. We were expecting to get GPUs. Of course, we didn't know exactly how much it would be, but at least order of magnitude. And as you can see this here, things work nicely. We were able to ramp up to 90,000 uh, instances in le less than 20 minutes. The first 60,000 actually were there in about 10 minutes. Kept it for uh, 90 minutes, had very short jobs, which is the worst case scenario for Condor. So we were able to run about 250,000 jobs uh, in uh, less than two hours using uh, uh, that pool. And by the way, those were real ice cube jobs. So uh, we actually produced useful science out of it, even if it was just a test uh, across all the regions and everything worked fine. So that showed that, yes, we should be able uh, to um, get as much as the clouds allow us to get. And uh, the number of GPUs should be really the only limit to what we can get. So we were pretty confident and here we go, we did it. It didn't go as smoothly as we were hoping for. If you, uh, in the picture up here is what actually happened. And you see there were two humps. We were hoping for a single hump going up here. So what happened was uh, that, yes, the fur hump went really well, but when we were here, uh, I looked around and said, huh, some features are not giving us uh, much. Actually, some didn't give us anything. So uh, scrambled around, uh, looked through the logs, looked through the web uh, interfaces of the cloud providers, and oops, some uh, regions uh, in the cloud were erroring out. So uh, had to manually, uh, essentially, un, uh, uh, find essentially a, uh, an alternative approach to start provisioning because we essentially were pushing uh, the cloud providers too hard. They do have limits. And, but then we got this night second uh, bump, got here, and he, this was pretty good. And we were hitting the two hour limit that we were actually interested in and said, okay, this is pretty much what we uh, can get. Maybe we can get another 10%, but uh, good enough. So we started the shutdown. And the shutdown uh, was meant to be, we let uh, the GPU jobs that already started running, run to completion, and uh, shut, uh, deprovision the resources as soon, or as close as soon as uh, the GPU uh, jobs finish. And that didn't go exactly to plan. One of the reason was that we hit a weird bug in some of the uh, cloud uh, interfaces that when they told them to shut down, they actually started to provision more resources. So uh, I effectively have to shut down a non-negligible fraction of uh, cloud resources by hand by just point and clicking because uh, the API forgot about them and started a, com a complete new set of resources that it was not, not supposed to, so I didn't have any automation for that. So, but I managed to shut it down, even with a little bit of waste. And uh, we did reach a peak of about 51,000 GPUs, about 380 petaflops in uh, uh, theoretical petaflops in floating point 32. Just for comparison, this is uh, almost the same to uh, what um, summit uh, at, uh, can uh, deliver. So we uh, managed to provide provision something that was in the same ballpark as the uh, number one uh, top 100 HPC system in the world without any special reservations, anything special using uh, essentially what was leftover capacity in the cloud. So uh, this is available to anyone who just wants to try. And down there, you see uh, the GPUs that we got, 
we used eight different generations of GPUs. Uh, and apart from the P4s, which really contributed very little, all the others actually contributed a non-negligible amount, either in number of GPUs or in number of uh, petaflops. Uh, and yes, this is uh, not something that can be applied to all kinds of problems. It uh, applies to an, uh, anything that is not tightly coupled, uh, but there are a lot of applications that are not tightly coupled. Yeah, forget uh, uh, global uh, FFT or anything that uses MPA all to all, that would not work. But anything that can be um, um, intelligently partitioned so that it has minimal communication will work just great. But that's the whole point. You want to go big uh, at a reasonable cost that, uh, without a lot of effort, you have to be flexible because as you can see here, we got resources from all over the place. Yes, uh, the US contributed about half, but another quarter came from the EU and Asia Pacific each. And down here, although I cannot show you, oops, uh, although I cannot show you uh, the names of all the regions, you can see that no region contributed a vast majority of resources. So if you want to scale this high uh, using opportunistic resources in the cloud, uh, you have to be flexible. And you have to be able to use all the GPUs too, because as you can see, no single GPU type contributed the majority of the resources. Uh, so we really, you really need to be able to use whatever is thrown at you in order to get uh, this kind of performance, essentially without uh, any advanced planning. All the advanced planning was simply our testing to convince ourselves that we can actually pull it off. There was no other preparation needed. And here is another uh, point of view. Uh, the other one was um, the number of uh, GPUs from the corner point of view. Here is the number of events processed uh, at the end of the exercise. And here you have a, a pie chart that shows the fraction of uh, events that were produced in the different cloud regions against, I don't have the list of them, the names, but you see that no one is, uh, has a large fraction. The biggest one I think is the brown one, and that is less than 11% of the total. So if you want to really get that many, uh, you need to uh, be flexible and go everywhere. And that's what the DHCC paradigm allow you to, and HD Condor as a tool is very good at uh, uh, helping you do this. And while we did this all in the cloud, it would, e is, it would be easy to mix and match on-prem and on-cloud resources. Um, and we actually plan to do this as a follow-up exercise, but this one was all in the cloud. As for financial costs, just wait a couple uh, of slides, we had that too. And here we go. Um, so first, uh, let me just spend a minute uh, discussing the value of the various GPUs. Uh, here you see the time span on the left side, you have the time spent per GPU during the exercise. And on the right, you have how many process was processed per GPU type. And you see, they don't look anything alike. Uh, newer GPUs are definitely uh, much faster than the old ones. So for example, we got about 42% of the science done with uh, V100s, but that was only 90% of the total wall clock time. On the flip side, the, if you take the sum of K80s and K520s, we spent more than a quarter of the time there, but less than 10% of all the events were processed there. So uh, it definitely, um, the new GPUs are way more efficient, uh, more effective than uh, the old ones. And yes, here is the uh, uh, slide of the cost. And we actually don't have the actual cost. We have the logical cost. Um, so just to give you an, uh, an idea, uh, let me go through it. And I'll give you a, a few numbers that are not on here uh, that I remember from on top of my head. Anyway, here you have the actual relative performance numbers of the various uh, type of GPUs. And you see that you are better off going with 
newer GPUs compared to older GPUs because they are simply more efficient, both in times of uh, performance compared to the um, peak flops and in re relative performance. Uh, the two most uh, cost efficient ones were T4 and V100, with T4 beating them all by, an, by a factor of three. So, uh, unfortunately, if we look back, we got only about 4,000 out of 50,000 of uh, T4s, and they are relatively slow. So, T4 contributed uh, only about 20% of the total um, of the total um, events because the capacity is not there in the cloud, but it is really, really cost effective compared to the others. And uh, whenever possible, we went spot, which is another 3x uh, cheaper than on demand. Uh, so uh, that really makes uh, the T4 very uh, cost effective compared to all the other GPUs. And just to give you a, a an idea how much that cost. Uh, we spent a little more, both because uh, we were aiming for uh, the max perform uh, more ma max performance and well mo max size of the uh, resources, and both because it, this was uh, a few months ago. Right now, you can get uh, in, on spot the T fours uh, for uh, between. 11 and 18 cents an hour. So that's uh, the cost in the cloud right now for T4s, which are the most cost effective. Uh, the other ones uh, will be three times more expensive because you will get there the relative science per dollar uh, uh, you see there. Uh, and as an aside, uh, we um, on-prem, we uh, tend to buy the uh, gaming GPUs because those are really uh, cost-effective, but you cannot get them in the, in the cloud. Uh, so that's all I have about cost. And I'll uh, give it back to Frank uh, to have go over the last few slides. Uh, and Ian, and I think that out. there's one more slide on uh, the two, each on the two question, types of questions that we've received. There's one on, on applicability and then one more on cost. But let me talk a little bit more about DHTC. Um, I think one of the uh, important things for making this sort of science work is uh, you have to go. No, you have to go too far further. Um, this one? No, uh, uh, deeper down, meaning 28 or so is where I want to be. This one? Yes, 29. Um, one of the things that is an essential enabler in IceCube is that they can and decide by virtue of their input that they prepare on how long the runtime is supposed to be. And therefore, they can cater their execution time to the um, uh, GPUs that we had available to us. And so we actually ran two types of input files that differed in times 10 in the number of input events per file. You can think of it that uh, in the uh, um, file that we ran on the higher end GPUs, we had 10 times more photons to propagate through ICE than in the files that we ran on the lower end GPUs. And so what you see here is an example of this one is the runtime distribution for T4 on the left, and on the right is the runtime distribution for the K80s, where the K80s were picked to have the smaller files and the T4s, the larger files. And you can sort of see that the spread, there is some spread from, um, uh, from file to file, in essence, meaning from um, um, a job to job, but uh, there is a, a reasonable, within a factor of two or so, we, uh, we can control the runtime by virtue of defining the input. And that is an essential feature in the sense also that um, it allows us to make all of these uh, computations independent. So if you, in places where you have a guaranteed um, multiple GPUs per 
uh, per uh, system, we could just run on those multiple GPUs in, in the job and therefore have fewer jobs running, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a bottom line is that a total of 10.2 billion events were processed across 175,000 GPU jobs, um, just to give you a sense. Um, the other thing that this here shows is that we made some of the uh, uh, jobs ran actually with the data being remote rather than local. So the uh, uh, um, purple here is when the data was remote and the green when the data was local. Um, so sometimes we grab the data from a nearby region because we didn't bother putting data into a region that we expected to have not many GPUs. And you can see that within reason, we can actually run across um, uh, remote, fetch data from remote, and uh, this still works. And uh, this is actually one of the things that we want to follow up on and see whether to, uh, we're right now checking and doing some tests to see whether we can actually run such that we don't have to use storage in the cloud at all and fetch all the data in real time um, from uh, Wisconsin. And so that's one of the follow-up things that we're currently investigating. Next slide, Igor, 30. Yep, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is, how does this apply to other things beyond IceCube? The one obvious thing that it doesn't apply to is of course, if you do lattice QCD simulations, those are so tightly coupled, there's no way that you could ever uh, use GPUs out of two different centers at the same time. The speed of light would just not allow it. The latency uh, um, uh, of message passing from one side to the next would just kill you. That's not possible. But there's a vast variety of different applications where it is perfectly possible to uh, segment things in independent chunks. The one obvious example is any large instrument that I know of, that I can think of, effectively has large computing needs simply because there's a large volumes of data, but the data can be independently processed and therefore partitioned by virtue of different input data for different jobs. And so this is, applies to the LHC, to LIGO, to Dune, to LSST, to pretty much anything that I know of. There's very little science from instruments that actually requires all data to be looked at by the same job. Um, and that I think is in the nature of the beast of running large instruments and taking big data. Um, and the same is true for mid-scale instruments that I can think of, um, uh, and I list some of them here. The same is true for CryoEM. Um, uh, if you look at the top um, uh, reconstruction algorithms these days for CryoEM, they typically are ported to GPUs. And while, if you had asked me a, a, a two years ago whether this works for CryoM, it didn't because um, CryoM was typically the a, a high end applications there where MPI applications required about 200 G CPUs or so. Um, since then, they've ported all of their software by and large to run in GPUs. And at this point, the people that I know who do CryoM reconstruction run in single GPUs. So again, it's become a, the fact that GPUs have becoming, are becoming more and more powerful makes more and more applications be um, high throughput computing capable and therefore can run in this kind of, of uh, way. Same is true for a large fraction of deep learning. Basically any deep learning application that does not train on very large data sets or actually I take this back any deep learning application that for which the network isn't so exorbitantly large that it exceeds the RAM in a node and therefore uses MPI to create large um, memory systems would, will generally be partitionable. Um, at least um, that's what I've seen. Uh, uh, we have a lot of deep learning and stuff running on ORG and um, the uh, uh, PRP and, um, and so uh, those kinds of, of installations are meant for deep learning. And so uh, deep learning is a perfect application that largely does not require, except for the very largest deep neural networks, largely does not require uh, 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 tightly coupled. So basically anything that has bundles of independently scheduled jobs that can be petitioned with just workloads to have uh, half to a few hours of runtimes on modern GPUs will work. Uh, next slide. 
then I want to uh, discuss a little bit more on the cost issues. Um, uh, the, a, um, there is a roughly 15K per three, 300 petaflop hours is what you could do. Um, uh, so the, if, we, um, if we haven't tried to max out on number of GPUs and instead focused only on the most cost effective GPUs, we would have probably been able to run a 300 petaflop hour at 15K in dollars. We actually paid quite a bit more uh, for a variety of different reasons, including the fact that we had these issues with shutting the thing down. Um, the, the other part of cost is that this burst was executed by two people, Igor and David. And um, in my mind, they have a uh, very uh, complementary skill sets. And most places that will want to do something of this sort will require two types of people, people who understand the applications and, and in, in uh, gory details, and then people who understand the infrastructure in gory details. Uh, Igor is the infrastructure guy, David the application guy uh, uh, to first order. And uh, so if you ask yourself to make this a routine operations capable for any open science that is DHCC capable, what would it require? I would argue that you'd roughly require the, the people you also need for on-prem. So I'm not going to count David as part of the cost that you'd need no matter what you're doing. But um, I'd say that you'd need it, a, an ego type person and then you'd need half an FTE of person that just deals with all of the crap that you have to deal with in order to uh, deal with budget related issues. If we had say dozens of customers all wanting 24 seven uh, support capability of this sort of thing. We need a half an FTE of a cloud budget manager and an FTE of an ego like person. And uh, then we'd it, uh, pay 15K per 300 beta flow hour. That's sort of the cost of this, doing this kind of thing. Um, uh, then um, next slide. Um, this, I think, is already the uh, summary slide in terms, and then I'm going to look through the chat and see uh, what uh, things I haven't answered, or uh, Igor hasn't answered. Ice Cube is ready for Exascale, and I want to make a much more philosophical comment in, in a way. Um, humanity has built these extraordinary instruments by pooling human and financial resources globally. If you ask yourself, how does Ice Cube, how does Ice Cube, can, how can Ice Cube be built? How can the LHC be built? How can LSST be built? Or how can any number of these very large, so LIGO, you name it, uh, pick, your, pick your poison. Um, any of these large endeavors, how can they be built? They can be built by pooling resources, human and financial, across the entire globe. The computing for these large correlations fits perfectly to the cloud or scheduling holds in exascale systems because it's ingeniously parallel by nature. Um, uh, you have to screw it up in order to make it not parallel, uh, ingeniously parallel. Um, and therefore, it fits onto these globally distributed systems. And it's therefore appropriate to use a DHC computing program because it applies to a very wide range of problems all of, across all of open science. And um, uh, just to name a few others, um, there are dynamic, uh, molecular dynamics uh, uh, ensemble uh, simulations. There are um, a variety of, we have uh, seen in political scientists, we've seen social scientists of various colors, a lot of economics uh, uh, um, uh, would fit into this. So it's just a very, very rich um, uh, set of science. Um, any other questions? What have I not addressed that has shown up in these questions on the side? Um, I'm, I'm uh, uh, several um, financial costs. I think I've uh, addressed. Um, uh, uh, I, I I hope that uh, this slide. I think it was just the previous slide that addressed the finances. Um, so, there is just a new one. Does the fifteen thousand k number include the cost of data storage for the staging part? Yeah, it's, uh, it was negligible no. for us. 
basically it was negligible and all the networking cost uh, was covered by uh, the 50 percent uh, waiver that all the cloud providers have so if your networking cost is less than 15 percent of the total cost it's free and we definitely and, were way uh, lower than that and let's let's be very very clear there are things the applications that are in principle um, uh, ingeniously parallel but in practice aren't and those are things that have very high IO requirements so if you think of it in as a, as a mental model if you are doing science by querying an SQL database then your IO to CPU is exorbitant because we are basically don't you, you typically don't uh, consume any CPU because your SQL query is basically CPU free. It's all dominated by IO. Those kinds of application would not work in this context, obviously, because as, um, even the, as somebody pointed out that our uh, uh, individual access to, in, uh, to uh, from individual nodes to, uh, um, to S3 isn't all that uh, large. So you can be a, a, a limited by IO requirements, or you can be limited by uh, um, uh, in the process communications requirements. And those are the sort of the two limitations that I can think of, of easily. Everything else will work, basically. Um, then there was a question about uh, VMs. Uh, some, could you give some information about how the software is deployed in the VMs? I'm wondering how one would have to compile for a wide range of GPU architectures and pick the right one depending on which GPU the particular VM has access to. I let Igor and David comment on this because I have no clue. Yeah, we did. <laughs> meaning, meaning you compiled it for each and every one of them or uh, what did no, you do? No, no, it, uh, it's OpenCL, so it just, ha it just works. So uh, it's a single executable that works on all the GPUs. Uh, David commented that uh, they have some logic inside that will slightly tune it for different memory sizes and number of cores, but that's about it. And it's completely dynamic. It's not uh, per GPU. You just query the I see. Uh, OpenCL and you do it. I see. So, so it's a magic executable that just works on all. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, then uh, I, I, I see. Uh, um, and uh, you will answer on the program language and libraries used. Um, then uh, data on the utilization efficiency of the experiment. How much of the charge wall time for cloud resource was used for setting up the environment versus staging data versus computation? Um, uh, Igor, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, it was trivial, essentially. Uh, probably the uh, most waste is uh, the time between the VM boots up and Condor actually scheduling the job. And that was usually in the order of uh, tens of seconds to uh, maybe a minute. You can see it uh, in the, when we uh, went up uh, from zero to 90,000 in CPUs, uh, the delay is negligible. So yeah, there is a little bit of uh, delay, but given that the jobs are tens of minutes, uh, that's in the one to few percent waste. And the data movement, it's small enough uh, that it's not, not an issue because we had all uh, um, the file transfer went to the same region. So uh, it was a, a couple of seconds at most getting data in and a couple of seconds getting the data out. And all the envir environment is pretty, com pretty much in place. So there is negligible uh, overhead there. Then there was a question about how much cooperation or assistance did you get? Uh, it ver uh, Benedict answered this further down. Uh, it varied dramatically in terms of uh, uh, one of the cloud providers we met weekly um, because they were so excited about uh, being involved in this that uh, uh, we literally had very, very a tight relationship. Um, uh, the others, uh, much less so. Um, the, uh, as, as Benedict puts it here, at some level, the biggest hurdle was the social engineering with the cloud providers. Um, so in essence, you don't get this kind of access because they're scared that you will consume vast amounts of money and then they, you won't be able to pay. So, so they, 
regulate this by simply putting uh, uh, quotas on you that you have to convince them of making higher and higher, or in our case, basically getting rid of them. Um, and so, so that sort of thing required a lot of, of, um, of uh, communications. Right, and the other thing, just want to make sure to, to make it clear, we didn't have any special privileges. We only uh, begged to have our limits raised. So essentially all we had to do is allow us to try to get the resources. That actually is not that trivial. That's Frank said, most likely because they are afraid you will not be able to pay the bill. But apart from that, we didn't get any other additional privileges from uh, their point of view. And we, uh, we picked our own time. We started our own uh, 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 pace. So it was not like they put some resources aside for us. It was just convincing them to uh, raise uh, the limits. That's it. So, so what this means in practice is if I had to advise the community and how to make use of cloud at large scales, I think it is advisable to have an entity um, that works with the cloud providers, establishes trust that they will actually pay the bills, and then have the community, the scientific community, work with that provider. So effectively, think of it as an a, as a a um, uh, an XD provider in the cloud. That would make sense. For every single scientist to try to do this by themselves is not scalable. I don't think so. That doesn't make any sense. Um, and so, so that, uh, that's sort of what we mean when we say um, the biggest hurdle is social engineering of some sort. Um, does that make sense? And then somebody asked whether we can share the presentation. Uh, I'm assuming that, uh, Igor, you've shared this already with Dana, and Dana puts it somewhere. I didn't. Yeah, so if, yeah, if you want to send it to me or put it in somewhere that I can grab it, I will share it out when I share the video. Yeah, sure, I will. Thanks. And I, I think that's the end of the questions, and everybody is very grateful. So, yes. Thank you, Igor. Thank you so much, and I thoroughly appreciate the ana the analysis you did for this and sharing it with the community. It's it's amazing, and and just I'm inspired by the idea of global research happening in this way. Um, and let, I'm gonna let me make let me make one more comment to this. Is uh, it also as PI who got the grant? from the NSF who or, uh, provide the money. Of course, I want to thank the NSF, obviously, but also it struck me that it is still surprisingly hard to get all of the accounts set up and all that kind of jazz. And uh, so I think the, the, uh, uh, that reiterates the notion that it makes sense to have a provider that deals with all of this, these hurdles, accounting setting up and all that kind of, of uh, stuff and the infrastructure set up that then the individual scientists work with. Yeah, agreed. I think there's a lot we can do as, you know, the, the technologist side of things to make this as easy as possible on the researchers. Lots of, lots of job security in there somewhere. <laughs> and of course, if, if anybody wants to do it again, uh, we're happy to take your money. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. And thank you. Thank you, Igor, the whole team. This was spectacular. And I think with that, we'll close for the day. And we'll see everyone next month. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thanks all. Bye.